Welcome to this emergency conference, Donald Trump's Great Harm to America and the World. It is a sequel to our major interdisciplinary conference from last year, The Dangerous State of the World and the Need for Fit Leadership, held at Washington's National Press Club and broadcast in full on C-SPAN. Now, more than a year later, our country faces multiple unprecedented and urgent dangers. There are many reasons, but as we have said in our public service book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, psychological dangerousness in a powerful office was bound to lead to social, cultural, geopolitical, and now civic and biological dangerousness. This is why at the start of the Trump presidency, we held our first conference at Yale School of Medicine with the nation's most distinguished psychiatrists to figure out how we would alert the nation. The proceedings went into the dangerous case of Donald Trump. 37 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president, an instant New York Times bestseller, and led to the formation of the World Mental Health Coalition, a professional organization of thousands of mental health experts from around the world. Private meetings with over 50 Congress members led to their asking us to educate the public in our domain so that they could act politically. Needless to say, expert voices are suppressed under authoritarian regimes, just as they have been under this administration. That is why in March of last year, we held our first major interdisciplinary conference in the ballroom of the National Press Club, um, broadcast the full three hours on C-SPAN with 13 distinguished speakers from the fields of law, political science, economics, history, philosophy, journalism, social psychology, climate science, and nuclear science, each speaking of how the president was unfit from their perspectives. We, we did not know at the time that there would be a pandemic, but we knew that faced with a crisis, an unfit president would mishandle it. We hence reassemble here today with most of those speakers to review the harm that has been done and what we can do in these dangerous times to prevent further harm. We will begin today's conference with a short five minute video summarizing what we have done and with quick scenes from last year's National Press Club Conference. This week's chaos in the Trump administration is by now unsurprising and was in effect predicted by the new book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President, edited by Bandy Lee, MD, a psychiatrist. The book includes and validates some of the general news media's speculation about Donald Trump's mental capacity. He is emotionally driven, not obviously intellectually driven, you don't even want to use that word with regard to Trump. And I absolutely believe that uh, any decision he makes is going to be primarily influenced by the intensity of the emotion he happens to be feeling at that moment. Which includes personal feeling about the person he's dealing with, whether he likes that person or not. You know, it isn't about liking the person, because Donald Trump doesn't like people. Mm -hmm. uh, what he does is he sees them as useful or not useful, and he sees them as uh, mirroring him and supporting him or opposing him and diminishing him. Thank you very much for joining us. The book is The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, and this is an historic work in the history of American psychiatry. A bill on Capitol Hill that could start a formal process to evaluate any president's mental fitness is getting more interest with 56 co-sponsors, all Democrats. The Democrat who introduced the bill joins me now, Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland. Congressman, thanks so much for being here. Uh, you and several of your Democratic House colleagues met with a psychiatry professor from Yale, Dr. Bandy Lee. She told CNN today, quote, as the president is unraveling, he seems to be losing his grip on reality and reverting to conspiracy theories. There are signs that he is going into attack mode when he is under stress. That means he has the potential to become impulsive and very volatile, unquote. Uh, did she say that to the assembled Congress people? Well, I think that uh, Dr. Lee and other psychiatrists who've been up to meet with members of Congress have been predicting uh, increasingly delusional and paranoid behavior on the part of the president. Um, 
of course, we're not mental health professionals, we're not psychiatrists, that's not our role, but we do have a very defined and important role under the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, which is to set up a body that could act with the vice president in the event of an emergency when the president becomes unable for mental or physical reasons to successfully discharge the powers and duties of office. Sure, so but... the bill just sets up the body that would be able to go to work if there were a real crisis. It was clear to my fellow doctors and to fellow scientists and to just concerned people that there was something seriously the matter. I'm concerned about many things about his mental instability, but especially in the immediate present, I'm most worried about his unfettered authority to launch nuclear weapons. We also can understand psychopathology, uh, this idea of a feeling that one has the right to do whatever they desire to do. We also see the idea of talking about obsession and compulsive uh, behavior being played out. We feel generally that there should be a more extensive kind of examination of American presidents or potential American presidents, and especially in relationship to their potential response to an extreme crisis such as nuclear threat. Trump has his finger on the triggers of three or 4,000 nuclear weapons, um, it's clear that if he even took one step in that direction, he could turn the world wars and the genocides of the 20th century into minor footnotes in the history of human violence. Good afternoon. Welcome to our conference event by the title, The Dangerous State of the World and the Need for Fit Leadership. In times of crisis, individuals regress to a state of delegated omnipotence and demand a leader who will rescue them and take care of them. And that, I would assert, is what is happening in contemporary society. It's a, a force for human destructiveness when the narcissistically wounded leader rages at the world for depriving him of mirroring and enlists his followers in attack. Last was Dr. Gerald Post, who could not join us today because of illness. Uh, but we will now begin our panel discussion, during which I will ask that everyone keep their microphones muted, except for the panelists. We will begin with our special guest speaker, Mr. John Dean, former White House counsel for President Richard Nixon, leading political thinker and co-author of Authoritarian Nightmare. Mr. Dean. Thank you. You know, President Kennedy often said you can, if you have anything to say, you can say it in a 20 minute speech. Today we have about four minutes or less, which is ample time to say what we would say if we had a 20 minute speech. I, Bandy, I want to thank you for including me in the program today. While I have a scheduling conflict and can't remain with you, I want to state that you and your collaborators have indeed provided a very valuable warning in the book you've gathered and the essays you have uh, collected. My collaborator, Bob Altmeyer, and I cite your work in our own study of authoritarianism. While you and your collaborators are looking at the very troubling man that's got elected in 2016 and now wants re-election, we focus on the people who elected Trump uh, and hope to re-elect him, his base. To undertake our study, uh, we really relied on about 50 years of social science that has been examining authoritarian personalities. This is Altmeyer's expertise. It's something I've been looking at for a little over a decade, having worked for the last authoritarian president, Richard Nixon. That didn't work out so well. To verify the science involved in this earlier work uh, and its application to Trump and his base, we had the Monmouth University Polling Institute undertake a national survey for us where they administered five personality tests to our respondents. We had a pool of about 230,000 people from which we drew about 1,000 registered voters, ranging from Trump lovers to Trump haters. The results were stunning. First, I can report that the Republican Party has become the authoritarian party. 
This isn't a matter of our saying so. Rather, this is what the respondents to the Mama survey informed us, that they were proud of their republicanism and they're proud of their authoritarianism. Second, let me say that we found the glue that holds these people together and makes Donald Trump so attractive to him is very simple. It's prejudice. These people are haters. I don't think any modern president, and I don't know about uh, the unmodern, the pre-moderns, uh, but no modern president certainly assembled so many prejudiced people into a coalition, and they make for a very, very stable base. They are racist, they're homophobics, and they don't like immigrants, even those who happen to come from immigrant families. Finally, let me head towards a conclusion by generally describing the authoritarian followers we found in Trump's base. There are two big categories. There are white uh, men without a four-year college education, and there are the so-called religious right, the white born-again Christians and the fundamentalists. They break down into three very broad categories in authoritarianism. They're social dominators, which, who are typically the men. They're dominating personalities. They oppose equality and desirous of personal power and amoral. We've had some presidents who are authoritarians, but I'd say that Donald Trump is certainly a, a poster boy. His followers, however, are made up of people that are tested in social science and known as right-wing authoritarian followers. They're both men and women. They're submissive to authority and aggressive on behalf of that authority. They also, all these people come up with rather stunning results in other personality tests that are administered. They're bull, bullying people. They're zealous. They have very little lack of, of critical self-analysis or critical thinking. They're moralistic, strict disciplinarians, and other, other traits. But now to cap off my four minutes, let me just thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to looking at the recording of this program. Thanks, Bandy. Thank you so much, John. Uh, it was so good to have you. And um, uh, I might just add that the right-wing authoritarian scale is something I've used for over 20 years with uh, treating prisoners. So it's a very relevant scale. Thank you again for coming on. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, a leading economist, university professor at Columbia, and co-author of the recent landmark report, 130 to 210 avoidable, avoidable COVID-19 deaths and counting in the US. Dr. Sachs. Andy, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership. And let me be clear, that's 130,000 to 210,000 uh, avoidable deaths. Right. Uh, we have, of course, uh, a national disaster and as you told us from the beginning a psychopathic leader uh, and a national emergency. Uh, we're going to have to uh, stick together in the coming days to do everything we can uh, to ensure that the democratic process works and I'm counting on us having a new president. And when we have a new president, we're going to need to take many emergency urgent actions to undo the incredible damage that this psychopath has uh, done. And I would like to just describe very briefly some of the most urgent steps that are needed that will be within reach of immediate action. Most importantly, we're going to need to implement the basic public health measures that could have been implemented since March and that would have saved those lives because we will have mounting deaths until we get in place basic national testing, contact tracing, face mask using, and the other essential provisions of public health that have been proven to avoid mass death, but which are not in place in the United States because of the psychopathic nature of this president and his administration. Second, we will need urgently to fund state and city governments. This is what he has rejected every day because it may be blue cities in his warped mentality. That means American cities that urgently need funding to provide basic services, schools, teachers, uh, frontline workers, 
including the public health measures that are needed, as well as the extended unemployment benefits that Americans urgently need. Three, we must urgently rejoin the World Health Organization, the Paris Climate Agreement, UNESCO, the Human Rights Council, and the International Criminal Court. Four, we must immediately end the US economic and financial sanctions on the civilian populations of Venezuela, Iran, North Korea, and others which are starving people, which are causing mass harms to civilian populations and which are tantamount or are legally crimes against humanity. Fifth, we should immediately call on China and with China for a mutual and immediate end to Trump's tariffs and China's retaliatory tariffs so that we reestablish normal relations with our counterpart nation. Six, we should the new president should introduce legislation to restrict the use of emergency decrees and orders. We are at the edge of democracy as we know now because the word emergency is pervasive uh, in our legislation and Trump has used that to the most dangerous extent. We may just get by narrowly right now, but this cannot persist with this kind of executive authoritarian power. Seven, uh, we need immediately to enact comprehensive voting rights reform so that we are not in the situation that we are today with the vulnerability of voter suppression, disenfranchisement, and the destruction of democracy. We'll get through this narrowly, most likely right now, but we must end this kind of voter disenfranchisement. Eight, we should introduce immediately legislation uh, to achieve by mid-century net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And fortunately, Vice President Biden has emphasized this point. At nine, we should immediately enact a jobs program. We have millions that have been rendered unemployed by the mishandling of this disaster, and they need help. They need livelihoods, and we need energy retrofitting of buildings, solar panel installations, electric vehicle charging stations, so much valuable work to do, and we can help put Americans back to work. And the final point that I would mention at this stage is that we need immediately to restart nuclear arms negotiations. Uh, to have uh, an immediate extension of the new START agreement and a freeze on U.S. nuclear arms, so-called modernization of the arsenal so that we can restart sanity at the global level of global uh, safety for the human species. Bandy, thank you so much for your leadership. You warned us from the start. It was a very hard message to convey. Uh, you faced many, many obstacles. We are with you and uh, most grateful to be part of this program today. I'm most grateful for your important and compassionate presentation, uh, Dr. Sachs. Uh, our next speaker is attorney Richard Painter, former Chief White House Ethics Counsel for the Bush-Cheney Administration, uh, professor of law at the University of Minnesota, and a co-author of an important report put out by the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Mr. Painter? Thank you very much, uh, Bandy. I've been uh, told that I have about three and a half minutes to sum up my concerns about President Donald Trump. Uh, well, that's actually a lot of time. One can do a lot in five minutes. For example, the President of the United States can order the launch of American missiles and land-based missiles probably would be in the air within five minutes, according to most military experts. It would take 15 minutes for the submarine launched missiles to get into the air, according to a lot of the experts. That's what Donald Trump could do. That is what we've exposed ourselves to for four years. I ask every American to read President Trump's Twitter feed, to listen to his speeches, to watch the debate, particularly the first debate against Vice President Biden, and ask yourselves the question, do you want this man in the White House with the ability to destroy human civilization in five minutes with a decision to launch nuclear weapons? That is just the beginning of our concerns about President Donald Trump, but it's a serious concern because there is no going back once that presidential decision is made and those missiles are in the air. 
President Donald Trump is mentally unfit for office. Vandy Lee has opined on that repeatedly at the risk of her career from those who wish to silence her academic freedom and her exercising not only her First Amendment right, but her obligation as a citizen and as a medical expert to speak out about the mental health of Donald Trump. We see on top of the president's mental instability, the gravitation of our federal government, the executive branch in particular, towards authoritarianism. And it is here that I would refer to the report that has just been issued on the Department of Justice under William Barr. This is a report by the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania and Cruz, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Uh, Professor Claire Finkelstein at the University of Pennsylvania, I believe, will add some remarks about that. The report details the serious infringements on civil liberties and violations of the rule of law in the Justice Department under Attorney General Barr. We've seen the State Department also used to implement the president's campaign agenda with the Secretary of State most recently giving a campaign speech from Jerusalem with the Jerusalem, this old city wall in the background, pitching Donald Trump's reelection during a diplomatic mission in clear violation of the Hatch Act. The president has received foreign government emoluments in violation of the United States Constitution, payoffs that the founders specifically prohibited in the Constitution, and three circuit courts of appeals have looked at litigation brought by private plaintiffs against the president, and two of those suits have proceeded beyond the courts of appeals. But we ask ourselves, why is Congress not doing more? Why has this president not been removed from office? And there I ask you, not only to hold President Trump accountable on election day, but every member of the United States House of Representatives and United States Senate who refused to hold this president accountable, every senator who refused to have a trial as mandated under the Constitution, and every elected official who has not done his or her job to defend our democracy. Our country is in serious trouble. We hope that every vote will be counted on Election Day, particularly in Pennsylvania, where I hear now that the Republican Party wants to go back to the United States Supreme Court, hoping for Justice Barrett to be there, waiting to stop the counting of the votes in Pennsylvania. This is a critically important juncture in our history, and we need everyone on board from now through Election Day and beyond. Thank you, Attorney Painter. Our next speaker will be Dr. Ruth ben uh, leading historian, professor of New York University, and expert on fascism, authoritarianism, war, and propaganda. Dr. ben -Giet, would you like to begin? Thank you so much, Bandy, and everyone who's here for this occasion. In March 2019, we had gathered at the National Press Club to alert the public to the many dangers Trump posed to our national security, foreign relations, civil society, and the toll of his corruption and ceaseless lying on American society. At that time, I concluded that while he was not fit to serve as leader and commander in chief of a democracy, Trump was superbly suited to rule over an autocracy due to his, quote, willingness to do anything, even lead the country into ruin to save his power. 18 months later, with coronavirus raging untamed, I revised my formulation. The president's not just unfit for office, but poses an existential threat to our nation. The danger is in proportion to the success he's had in areas he cares about most. And I think it's wrong to say that uh, Trump is a weak or lazy person because he's actually worked overtime to impose on, on the issues that he cares about most, such as imposing a strict loyalty regime on GOP politicians and reducing the party to being an instrument of his personal needs and desires, such as defending him no matter what he says or does, or smearing his enemies. And these are party functions that you don't normally see in democracy, you see them in autocracies. But the danger also lies in the fact that so many Americans, unused to anything but democracy, 
came to this encounter with Trump undefended and psychologically unprepared to combat him or even fully digest the magnitude of his crimes. And it is hard to recognize <clears throat> that Trump, <clears throat> excuse me, that Trump is not in fact in office to govern in any traditional sense of the word. He's there to make money for his private businesses and stay in power to avoid prosecution. Throughout history, the human capacity for denial has led people to be unable to see what's in front of them until it's too late in situations of declining democracy. And even after the last presidential debate, like a few days ago, our major newspapers ran headlines that gave Trump credit for behaving, leaving aside the normalization of his lies and the fact that he won't even say if he'll leave office if he loses. So too many Americans still cling to what I call the pivot delusion, the desperate hope that Trump will somehow be a normal leader after all. And, and I say this with compassion because it's, there's a sense of dread in admitting that there won't be any normality. It means that you have to do something about it, that life can't go on as usual. But it's also meant that we've lost a lot of time and missed valuable opportunities for openings to get him out of office. And in fact, once authoritarians get into office, it's very hard to get them out. The upcoming election may put us in the historic position of being able to turn back an ongoing practice of authoritarian capture. If not, we will need a vast work of civic education. And I hope uh, that we could form a working group as part of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben Giet. Our next speaker is Dr. Jason Stanley, leading philosopher of language and epistemology, expert on propaganda and professor at Yale University. Dr. Stanley. Thank you and thank you for the work that, that everyone here has been doing and it's an honor to follow Professor Ben Giat, whose work has so influenced mine. I wanna talk for a moment about something that might seem uh, less pressing, which is the kind of propaganda and politics that we're looking at. Uh, I think this kind of propaganda and politics leads to things that we that are obviously incredibly concerning, like the response to COVID-19, possible use of nuclear weapons, uh, dehumanization of our fellow citizens and uh, undocumented immigrants. This is a politics based on a friend enemy distinction. Um, I've argued that what we've seen, what we see here is fascist politics. Uh, fascism is a cult of the leader that's, uh, who promises national restoration in the face of supposed humiliation brought on by immigrants, minorities, and leftists. And he says that only he can restore the nation. Uh, I don't think we face uh, a fascist regime. However, we must, we don't face a fascist regime. However, we must look to the fact that the courts have been captured already uh, by uh, a party that is largely becoming uh, not the Republican Party of yore, but a cult of the leader. Why is friend-enemy politics so dangerous? Um, well, our friend-enemy politics, uh, and, and why, are we, uh, wh why are we susceptible to it if we're, we've been a democracy for so long? Well, let's remember that white nationalism has a strong, powerful history in our country. It's what I learned about in school, and it's what we're seeing again. Voter suppression, Jim Crow being brought back. People say it's not white nationalism because there are black Trump supporters. Well, that's what they said in the South as well. There are good, uh, there are good uh, 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 black uh, citizens, the ones who support the anti-democratic order. So, uh, so the fact that there are uh, immigrant and, uh, and uh, supporters of color of Trump is neither here nor there. He's promising to return us to a white nationalist uh, uh, system uh, where he is restoring the order, the make, making America great again. Uh, why is this so risky for us beyond what the Civil War uh, already showed us? Uh, well, uh, in a friend-enemy distinction, truth is destroyed uh, because even if your enemy is speaking, saying true things, uh, then uh, it doesn't matter. They're saying true things only in order to win. All that matters is winning in a friend-enemy distinction. If your leader lies, then at least he's lying for you because it's battle. And in a battle, uh, the truth and lies don't matter. Just winning matters. Uh, third, 
uh, to what Timothy Snyder calls Sado populism. Uh, the, the joy at seeing one's enemy suffer uh, is central to this politics. Uh, it's called somewhat uh, moderately owning the libs here. But the desire to see people in blue cities and blue states suffer, the desire to see opponents, minorities, immigrants suffer, uh, is, is central to this politics. And finally, nihilism. Nihilism is central because in a war, you get in a mindset where it's pleasurable to see your enemy suffer and your own existence is less important than the ultimate demise of the enemy. So the end of all of this politics is ruin for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. Our next speaker is Dr. Gar Alperovitz, leading political scientist, founding fellow of uh, leading policy institutes and former professor of political economy at the University of Maryland. Dr. Alperovitz. Thank you very much, uh, Bandy. Uh, I'd like to turn the direction a little bit towards a, a different context. Why is it that we Americans elect a man like Donald Trump? So we under, there's enough, enough we're going to say about the man himself, but I think what we need to look at is something what I would call a, a systemic crisis emerging in many parts of the world where populists of this kind are emerging. And so if you look at that context, the question becomes, what is our responsibility in changing the political and economic strategies that have allowed these emergent figures to come again and again in Europe and here? And I think we will see more in both places. And I would say that we are at the end of a period when we can accept the traditional politics of uh, basically based on social democracy, which was supported by labor unions. I, was, I am and was part of that, working in both houses of Congress and in the executive branch of the US government. But American labor unions have disappeared. Basically, they're down to 6% of the labor force in the, in the private sector. The basis of the old liberal, liberal politics and social democratic politics has declined, leaving the vacuum that a man like Donald Trump or others may fill. So it's our responsibility both to get rid of this man, to prevent another one to come, but also to deal with and first simply to confront the need to deal with a whole transformation of our political and economic direction, which means rebuilding from the bottom up a new kind of politics. Fortunately, there are many, many signs that there is a new politics building. There's also a new economics in communities around the country where there are large scale community building efforts of economic ownership not only cooperatives, but large scale economic community building efforts, rebuilding the basis of a new politics that can stabilize the system over time. This is the kind of work that we had when, with the leading civil rights workers began 20 and 30 years out, laying down the foundations of what became the transformative period of civil rights. And those of you who have followed it just under the horizon, just under the spectrum that's covered by the normal press, there is enormous explosion of not only cooperatives, but complex, large-scale, four or 500 worker community-owned enterprises, new environmental strategies, public banking beginning to develop, public planning developing in many states, much of it not yet covered by the mainstream press, but increasingly understood by many, many pol political figures in states around the country, laying the foundation for a politics that can preempt the next Donald Trump, not simply waiting for us to allow and to have and to permit the development of the kind of people who are paranoid or the psychologists among us will describe more sharply can exploit the divisions we face. So I would turn the horizon towards us and what we can do in the next period. Elect a Democrat would be my favorite, but also to rebuild the basis of a new politics, just as happened in the progressive era, just as happened in the civil rights era, but laying down economic foundations on the basis of many, many, many developing experiments and efforts around the country that suggest a new direction beyond the context which allowed us to accept and build a man like Donald Trump into the office of the presidency of the United States. Thank you very much for that, Dr. L. Peravitz. Our next speaker will be Dr. Joseph Fromm, leading climate expert, physicist, former Acting Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy and Editor-in-Chief of Front Page Live. Dr. Rom? 
Well, thank you, Bandy. Thank you again for, for, for having me uh, back to this. Um, I want to go back to just the presidential debate, the last one, um, where uh, Joe Biden said, you know, we have to transition off of oil in the coming decades. And uh, this is, this became, you know, somehow a gaffe. And uh, it, I think, shows the state of our politics and our media that a statement of absolute fact, we must transition off of oil over the next few decades if the world is going to avoid catastrophic sea level rise and wildfires that make the ones that are currently going on look mild and, you know, heat waves and dust bullification. But nonetheless, how does the media treat this, you know, Donald Trump repeats, oh, you know, this is the biggest gaffe. This is the biggest gaffe ever. And as a result, the media reports, oh, you know, Joe Biden is on the defensive. Um, this, is, this is the state of affairs that we have gotten into for a couple reasons. One of which is that, that um, you know, big oil uh, and big coal launched one of the biggest disinformation campaigns in the world to spread these lies. And those have since been picked up by right-wing media like Fox News, the online Russian Trump bots. Uh, and frankly, you know, this stuff appears every day on Facebook because Mark Zuckerberg simply refuses to ban it. This is the enabler of Trump. I mean, Trump is merely sort of taking to the ultimate level what the tobacco companies were able to prove, what do, what the big oil was able to do, which is hey, we don't have to run a disinformation campaign on just one thing. We can just lie all of the time. And as I said last time, you know, Trump is a con man. His personal attorney said he was a con man. His founding text is a declaration that he's a con man. His 1987 book, The Art of the Deal, said, explains that Trump uses, quote, hyperbole and, quote, exaggeration to, quote, play to people's fantasies. So, you know, he, he is a self avowed liar. Obviously, the Washington Post and others have documented uh, just more lies than than any other president, you know, probably by about a factor of 10, maybe a factor of 50. But to this day, the media treats him as a president who happens to lie rather than a con man who happens to be president. Uh, and so they let the tall tales and the fantastic tweets drive the daily news cycle. And, you know, I think if and and, and uh, you know, for those who thought, oh, these lies aren't material, the denial of science isn't material, we have obviously seen with COVID-19 the, the, you know, the, the highest level of danger posed by an embrace of pseudoscience, an embrace of a con man who, who lies all the time, is unfortunately, you know, over 100,000 Americans dead who didn't have to die. There's just no question about that. We're at like 230,000. At least 100,000 of those would not have died if we had had a, uh, you know, a president who accepted science and who did not lie all the time. And I think, unfortunately, we're headed towards a path where we're going to lose another unnecessary 100,000 Americans uh, because Donald Trump is president. So, you know, I think it's incumbent on everyone you know, what is the solution? We will get rid of Trump and hopefully we'll be getting rid of Trump this November. Uh, and obviously that is a priority. But we need to make a, a, a really a recommitment to science and to um, the scientific uh, process. Again, it's not that scientists aren't human beings who, who, scientists are human beings and scientists make mistakes, but the scientific method, the scientific process um, is there to weed out people's personal beliefs and, and prove and demonstrate things like, hey, you know, the burning of fossil fuels is warming up the planet dangerously, and on our current path, we are set towards a catastrophic level of warming. So, you know, I just want to, you know, underscore that uh, obviously Trump's imminent threat to democracy is the greatest peril he poses. But the longer term peril he poses to the entire world is blocking global climate action for another four years, another four years that we absolutely positively don't have. So I just want to thank you, Bandy, for giving me the opportunity uh, to make some of these remarks. Thank you, Dr. Rom. 
Our next speaker is Mr. David, J., uh, David K. Johnston, Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist and reporter on worldwide tax, public finance, and business. Mr. Johnston? Oh, well, thank you, Bandy. And uh, we have published a number of Bandy's pieces at the news service my friends and I run, which is free and ad free, DC Report. Um, I've known Donald for 32 years, and I have what I'm sure is the world's largest collection of Trump documents. Four years ago, one of the reasons Donald Trump was able to get to the White House was that my peers utterly failed in their duty to investigate Donald. Uh, for example, nobody seemed to know, even though I reported again back then, that uh, Donald had been deeply entangled with a major international cocaine trafficker for whom he did extraordinary favors that, in my view, make it clear he was in the cocaine trafficking business on the financing end. He uh, has been tried twice in the past for tax fraud, civil tax fraud, lost both cases. And there are many other things about him I put in my book, The Making of Donald Trump, but I couldn't get my peers, uh, my former colleagues at the New York Times and the LA Times, to pay any attention to this. Now, having said that, I think it's important we recognize that Donald Trump is not the problem. He is the symptom of a problem. Uh, yes, Donald is in the vernacular crazy. I recognized that decades ago. Uh, he is a sociopath. You are not a person. No one around him is a person. They are objects to be used, abused, and thrown away. Uh, but the people who support Donald Trump have real grievances that we, and I mean those of us on this panel, have failed to recognize, appreciate, and do anything about. And let me give you a simple killer fact uh, from uh, using 45 years, the 45th president, let's go from 2018, the most recent data back 45 years to 1973, the highest year of union membership in America. The average income of the 90% what I call the vast majority in inflation adjusted dollars is down 4%. That means in 2018, 90% of Americans got by on 50 weeks pay for a 52 week year compared to 1973. Their average uh, decline, $1,600. Now what happened to the 1% of the 1%, the oligarch class? Well, their income went on average from 5 million to 30 million. And by the way, that's only the income required by law to be reported on tax returns. Uh, many people have enormous incomes. They are not required to report, as I explained in my trilogy on the American economy. Well, for each dollar that each person in the bottom 90% lost, each person in the 1% of the 1% gained $19,100. That's what inequality is, and it's primarily caused by government policies that I detailed when I was at the New York Times and put in my books, uh, Perfectly Legal, Free Lunch, and The Fine Print. Now, uh, my worry is less about Donald Trump's unfitness for office, and he's obviously completely unfit for office. That's why I dropped everything I was doing on June 16th, 2015, and have devoted my life since then, not what I intended to do at my age, to making sure we got all, all the facts we could about him. Uh, but Donald is not uh, successful at what he wants to accomplish. First of all, he's done most of it through being a criminal. He's the third generation head of a four generation prime family. And uh, he is, he is in fact lazy. He's very lazy. That's why he watches TV all day. You don't have to work hard to accomplish some things. What happens when we get a president who is like Donald, but he is not mentally ill? Someone who has an actual education, not a claim of an education. Someone deeply steeped in philosophy as Adolf Hitler was. Someone who uh, has very serious, well-developed management skills, which Donald clearly does not have. That's what I worry about, because there is, in fact, a strong authoritarian streak in this country. There always has been, and human nature being what it is, there always will be. What we need to address is the conditions that have led to uh, a majority of Americans not being able to come up with $1,000 in an emergency and and 40% uh, of them not $400 in an emergency. 
to the equity in Americans over, in their homes over the last 30 years. Every time people added a dollar of equity, they took on $2 of debt. The insecurity of jobs, the stripping of arts and music and literature from our public schools, all done because of the unstated Republican philosophy. The reason we don't have more investment in jobs is that the rich don't have enough. But if we just get them more, then they'll see to it our economy booms. And how do we get that? We take it from the children, the disabled, the elderly, the sick, the people who can't fight back. It's us who put them there. It is a democracy. It's our failings to address the needs of those people who think Donald Trump is their savior that should be on our shoulders for not directing ourselves to the concerns of these millions and millions of Americans who've seen their fortunes decline and feel quite legitimately that we don't care about them. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. Our next speaker is Dr. Phil Zimbardo, leading social psychologist and principal investigator of the famous Stanford prison experiment. Dr. Zimbardo? Greetings, everyone. Uh, I am honored to be on this panel and I have learned so much from my colleagues. I wanna focus on uh, two of Donald Trump's traits that uh, at the core of who he is and why he, is, he, he, he was and is dangerous to our, our survival. He's an extreme present hedonist. I developed a scale called the Zimbardo uh, Time Perspective uh, perspect, uh, Inventory uh, and we studied people around the world and to be a present hedonist means you live in the moment. Uh, you, you seek novelty. Uh, you, you live only for enjoyment. You never think about the future. You never link what you're doing now to its future consequences. Um, and also he's an extreme narcissist. Everything is about I, he, he and me. Uh, we saw this in the first debate where he was uncontainable, that he, they, couldn't, they couldn't hold him down. He was you know, oozing all over the place. In the second debate where they had a mute, uh, he was contained. But uh, two interesting things. The moderator um, asked uh, uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, imagine you are elected as president uh, in the next election. What would your uh, acceptance speech be to the nation? And Biden said, he said, so th this means you have to imagine, you know, something that's going to happen next, next month. And Biden accepted that and simply said, my fellow Americans, as your president, I will do the following three things. When it was Trump's turn, and this is, you know, this is his, his uh, most, uh, most fervent desire to be the president, he couldn't do that. He couldn't project himself into that future. And he kept complaining about what ha had, he had been talking about earlier, that people don't appreciate uh, what he's done, uh, he's underappreciated. Uh, and then, uh, so that's, that's one instance. Recently, he's been um, uh, giving, going around the nation in a, a fervent, he actually loves being up on the stage. So he loves these things. Um, and and in, recently, he was going on and on about how washing machines and uh, showers waste water. But not just mentioning it, taking five to 10 minutes, you know, to, the, to this audience. Uh, and this, what this was, was he was following up on Biden's uh, sense of that he, he is not interested in conservation. He's not interested in the, the, that we have to conserve our resources uh, given the climate change. So uh, his, his un inability to project what's needed uh, by America uh, to go from where we are to where we should be. Uh, and also what it means to be a uh, present hedonist is you seek novelty, you're, you're bored by sameness. And he's, he's virtually said this, the, the problem with COVID-19 is it keeps coming on, it keeps, it's on and on, it's boring. He said, essentially, he, he, with his hand, he said, let's get past it, uh, let's get by it, uh, let's get on. So that, so these are the traits that make him totally unfit to be a president, make him unfit to, to be anything, 
and, and, and uh, continues to be a danger. So the best, best thing that can happen is we vote him out of office uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zimbardo. Now for our fi final panelist, uh, we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Noam Chomsky, leading linguist, cognitive scientist, and cultural clinic critic. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, are you with us? Okay, um, it seems, that? oh, there you are. Okay, good. Oh. After Please begin. 70 years at MIT, I'm not very good at technology. Sorry. Uh, well, I've been listening with great interest to the other panelists have brought up uh, crucial issues. I don't want to repeat them. Uh, there's no need to dwell on the significance of this election. There's never been one with such uh, uh, amazing, remarkable consequences. Uh, and uh, it should be borne in mind that uh, to defeat, to remove Donald Trump from office will be no easy job. Uh, if he loses the election by a small margin of votes, he will win the electoral college. Unless there's an overwhelming uh, vote against him, he's likely even to win the electoral college, thanks to our highly regressive political system, which is very serious. If the United States were to try to enter the European Union with our current political system, that we'd be turned down by the European Court wow. of Justice. There are many very serious issues to be concerned with. So first, he needs an overwhelming, Biden would need a substantial victory, popular victory margin. And even then it's not secure. As you all know, uh, the president has declared publicly that if he doesn't like the outcome of the election, he may just refuse to leave office. And the political party that's behind him accepts this. They have batteries of lawyers working on ways to find a way to uh, get around the election if it doesn't come out the way they want. Now, this is taken very seriously. I suspect you've all seen, for example, the open letter written to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, top military officer, by two highly regarded uh, retired military commanders, John Nagel, Paul Yingling, uh, reminding the chairman of the oath he took when he took the office, namely to defend the country against enemies, domestic and foreign. They said, we now have a domestic enemy, a lawless president, backed by a party of supplicants who it may, may demand to retain office around himself by paramilitaries and armed militias. And it is your duty, General Milley, to send in the military, maybe a battalion of the 82nd Airborne, to disperse the f forces around him and remove him physically from office. Whether this is realistic, I don't have any idea. But the very fact that it's being discussed is a shocking comment on the nature of the political system. It's nothing like this has happened in 350 years of parliamentary democracy in England, 250 years here. It's very serious. Well, suppose Trump is in office for another four years. Uh, his relentless drive to uh, accelerate the race to disaster on climate, on environmental destruction, may very well carry us to tipping points that are irreversible. If not, uh, it will certainly make it far more difficult to deal with the crucial existential problems in the 
limited time available, a decade or two. Uh, the uh, threat of nuclear war, which is severe, will almost be certain to increase. He's dismantled most of the arms control regime, uh, developing new weapons of mass destruction, uh, basically inviting others to do the same. Uh, there are many provocative acts around the world which are severely raising the danger of war, the Middle East, Russian border, off the coast of China. All of this is sure to increase. It'll, those who know the record of uh, nuclear threat of, of nuclear issues since 1945 know that it's a virtual miracle that we've survived. Another accelerating the threats that reduces the possibility of survival substantially. Meanwhile, our democratic institutions are being shredded. Uh, the extreme end of this is the uh, idea that he may simply not leave office. The problems that we face are all international in scope. Uh, global warming, nuclear war, the pandemics, they have no borders. Trump's wrecking ball is destroying the international institutions that have to work together to convert these crises. His wrecking ball has no limits. Any international treaty or arrangement that he didn't create has to be destroyed systematically one after the other. And most recently, uh, pulling out of the consortium, COVAX consortium, that's uh, working on cooperative efforts to create a vaccine and distributional problems to ensure that it'll go to those who need it, those who monopolize it. That has to be destroyed. U.S. pulls out. Uh, biodiversity conference going on under the UN, very significant in its consequences. One country is missing. We can't participate. It's international. We have to destroy it. One after the other. Uh, the uh, maybe the most highly regarded uh, economic and political correspondent in the English-speaking world, uh, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, who recently wrote that uh, with regard to the destruction of the international order, if Trump is reelected, he said, it'll be terminal. Well, terminal may be an exaggeration, but it'll certainly be a devastating blow. Uh, as a number of people have pointed out, David K. Johnston most clearly, Trump is a symptom. He's a symptom of the destructive impact of the neoliberal programs of the last 40 years. It was never obscure where they were going. You can remember Ronald Reagan's inaugural address. Government is the problem. Decisions have to be taken out of the hands of government which has a flaw, it's partly responsive to the public. So we therefore have to end that. The decisions don't, uh, are not eliminated. They go to somewhere else. Where? Unaccountable private institutions. That's where the decisions may, must be made in the corporate sector. Uh, what this means was spelled out immediately by the neoliberal economic guru, Milton Friedman, wrote a famous article at the same time saying the sole goal of a corporation must be self-enrichment. Meanwhile, rules of corporate governance were changed so that CEOs could elect their own board to set their remuneration. Put all this together, it's not hard to predict what will happen. There's actually a recent attempt to estimate it by the Rand Corporation, uh, tried to figure out how much uh, wealth was transferred from the middle class and the working class, lower 90% of the population, to the top during the neoliberal years. Uh, the figure they arrived at is $47 trillion lost by the working class and the middle class not 
to the top 10%, to the top fraction, actually fraction of 1% if you look at the way it's distributed, uh, the top 0.1% of the population uh, now hold over 20% of the wealth. That's twice what they had when these programs began. Trump is turning a monstrosity into a caricature. Getting rid of Trump won't end the monstrosity. There's a lot to recover. Now, we know the answers to everything, every problem that's been mentioned. We have ways of dealing effectively with the environmental crisis. They're within reach, they're feasible. Case of nuclear weapons, it's obvious. Case of inter international institutions and our own democratic institutions, yes, we know what can, has to be done. The answers are there, but knowledge is not enough. It's necessary to grasp the options that are available energetically with dedication, with commitment. If we don't do that, the fate of the human experiment is very much in danger. Thank you, Dr. Chomsky, for that sobering critical note. Um, if you'd like to stay for one minute, we will start uh, a 10 minute round table conversation among panelists um, discussing solutions. Major problems require multidisciplinary solutions. And so now based on what you have all heard, uh, we'd like to go through um, each person in speaking about solutions. So feel free to give your one minute uh, analysis and uh, recommendations. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, would you like to add anything in terms of immediate solutions at this time? Well, there's no time in a minute to go through possible solutions for all of these problems, but I would just like to emphasize that there are solutions. Just start with the environmental crisis. There are very detailed proposals, very solid proposals, some worked out by colleague, co-author of mine, Robert Pollan, economist at University of Massachusetts, some by Jeff Sachs, fine economist at Columbia, using different models, they all pretty much converge. With uh, two or three percent of gross domestic product, uh, a fraction of what's spent on other things, we can reach uh, the level of net zero emissions by mid-century. Biden's GAF, as the press described it, but a prerequisite for survival. Yes, we can reach that with better jobs, more jobs, a better life for everyone. The means are readily within reach. Uh, the same is true of the other issues. To dismantle the entire neoliberal assault of the past generation, which is incidentally bipartisan. Clinton contributed to it, Obama contributed to it. That's a job and that's gonna require significant activist effort uh, to press the political system towards more reasonable social democratic objectives and to go beyond that all can be done, it's been done before, can be done now. Thank you, Dr. Chomsky. Uh, I know you have limited time. Thank you so much for your contributions and for joining us. Thank you, sorry, I have to leave. Bye-bye. So we will turn to the rest of the panelists. Uh, perhaps we can go in order. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, is there any comment you would like to add as a solution? Thank you very much. What, uh, what an honor to be with uh, all of uh, the, these panel members. Uh, what, a, what an honor and uh, so, so thankful, uh, Bandy, for you pulling us together. I, I would just like to add uh, for a moment uh, that what uh, uh, Professor Chomsky just said about solutions to the climate crisis, we'll be issuing a r report that is a nationwide multi-university study uh, 
this coming week showing that at incredibly, at basically no cost, we can move to decarbonization because the uh, clean energy sources have become so inexpensive uh, at parity with the polluting energy sources and creating so many more jobs uh, that uh, this is not a trade-off. Uh, it's not expending huge costs because we need to save ourselves. It's no cost virtually, uh, basically, uh, in order to have a better world. This is like so many of the challenges that we face. Uh, the solutions are not huge burdens. We have to pull the politics out of the hands of the t tiniest uh, but quite powerful elite. And just to put a couple of uh, numbers uh, on this uh, grim reality, as of uh, uh, yesterday, I don't have this morning's news, but as of yesterday, the richest 500 people in the world had a net worth of $6.8 trillion, 500 people. Uh, and this year, those 500 have had an increase of their net wealth of $964 billion during this so-called depression. Well, it is a depression for most of humanity, but for the 500 richest people, they've had an increase of $1 trillion, essentially. Mr. Bezos uh, by himself, Bezos, $188 billion net worth as of yesterday. The top 10 people, $1 trillion, 10 individuals. So if we have any intelligence as a species, uh, of course, we will get rid of uh, this uh, uh, psychopath, uh, but then we will understand, and I think there's a real chance that uh, because of the growing public awareness that we can move forward on real solutions and break the hold of this tiny oligarchy that is so enriched, so empowered in recent years, but holding back solutions that we need. And uh, I mentioned several, I think we can actually do this, but for the next few weeks, let's get this guy out of there because that is obviously our number one priority. And as Noam Chomsky said, it is, uh, it's gonna be a very difficult uh, job, even with a clear election victory. So we're gonna to have to stick together very strongly in the coming weeks. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Attorney Richard Painter. You have one minute. I would say the first part is getting Donald Trump out of office. Uh, and we've got to make sure every single vote is counted uh, uh, on uh, election day and after election day. Uh, votes should be counted, every single vote. And we've got to make absolutely sure that happens. Second, we do need to address economic inequality of this country, unemployment. Uh, it's a serious problem, and usually, uh, not always, but usually authoritarian governments rise to power when there is a great deal of economic inequality and anger uh, over it. Third, we need to fix our campaign finance system. We cannot have money determining who is elected president, senators, Congress people in our country. More and more of this money is foreign money. If we don't fix our campaign finance system, we are going to have election interference. It may not be through computer hacking. It may be through our campaign finance system more directly. But we need to make sure that our democracy works. And right now, money equals power in the United States. And that doesn't work. Thank you. Next, Dr. Ruth ben -Giet, one minute. So when, when authoritarians show up, um, they expose the weaknesses of the system. And they show how democracy is, to some extent, an honor system. We, there's a lot that we assume people will uh, behave in ethical ways. And so one thing that obviously needs uh, addressing is uh, mechanisms for vetting candidates. But the whole apparatus of accountability and trans, you know, tr transparency uh, and, and, and the, the, the financial architecture that allows these people to uh, to uh, prosper, 
All, I think that Trump and his cronies have shown up how much work there is to be done um, to prevent this from happening again. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Jason Stanley, One Minute Solution. Uh, Dr. Stanley. Focus, yeah, I'm going to focus on what I work on, which is language and communication. Here's a barrier that I see. I think the most important message that I've heard in, the, uh, in this conversation is that Trump is a symptom of neoliberalism and not the cause. And so what we need is we need fundamental structural change. What's the barrier to the structural change? Anytime people try to raise solutions, they're, they're called anti-capitalist. They're called socialist. Uh, we need to change the social meaning around phrases like capitalism and socialism because uh, we can't have that kind of war of words happening. Some of the solutions we face are not going to come from private industry. Many of the solutions we face are not going to come from private industry. We have to challenge capitalism uh, and we have to change, we have to say to people, okay, a lot of what we face will require solutions that where government's going to be seriously involved and you can't fear words like socialism, unions, etc. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gar L. Perovitz? Let me uh, uh, second the remarks that have been made by Noam Chomsky and Jeffrey Sachs and Jason Stanley. Uh, what I want to say, suggest, however, is that the forward motion in the direction of a liberal or social democratic or progressive solution in virtually all advanced systems has depended upon a strong institutional base of labor unions. That's been critical. American labor unions in the private sector are down to 6% of the labor force, all but disappeared. Rebuilding the institutional foundations of the next progressive politics that will be capable of solving the problems that a man like Mr. Trump is exploiting is critical. Fortunately, there's a great deal of work on the ground, building new community and worker-owned structures around that the press doesn't cover much. Public banks are beginning to develop all over the country. Land ownership of community buildings beginning to develop. These are the preliminary developmental structures that point towards a transformative base for a new politics beyond the weakening politics of traditional liberalism, out of which I came which based on labor unions, but looking for a much more powerful direction that opens up a big space for the building, or we'll run into more exploitation of the problems that the weak politics we now have is occurring all over the world. Donald Trump is not the only, only populist. This is a worldwide phenomenon, which is gonna require a fundamental solution, new direction institutionally at the base of our politics. Thank you. Dr. Joseph Rahm. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, you know, one of, uh, and I, I certainly echo uh, what, what Dr. Chomsky and, and Dr. Sachs said, and I appreciate that the great work that Dr. Sachs has been doing on solutions to climate change. Uh, and, you know, if, if Biden uh, is elected, I think that we are going to see uh, a very aggressive and progressive uh, clean energy and climate program. I just want to say that one of the things that progressives, liberals uh, have to learn how to do is communicate a whole lot better. Um, it's clear uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the focus on this fact-based, logic-based, uh, uh, you know, communications, this is, you know, facts are not what what persuade people, and I and I think you know, uh, uh, Dr. Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for helping create behavioral economics, said that you know facts are not what persuade people; they need a story. And you know, I uh, it's one of the reasons I launched FrontPageLive.com. We try to uh, f you know uh, tell uh, the accurate stories of climate change and and and. Uh, the news in general, but in a way that can go viral. And I had written written a book, How to Go Viral and Reach Millions, and, and generally work with groups to help them understand that, uh, you know, what, what Trump has shown is that, is that there is a powerful way of communicating that, that is not 
grounded in uh, logic and facts and numbers and literal language. And um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't represent the truth. You know, climate change is reality, but it is incumbent on us to learn how to communicate a lot better. And I, and I just think that what is taught in, in schools and higher education about effective communications is in fact the exact opposite of the way most people talk. And as a result, uh, it has been possible for the right wing and conservatives to you know, characterize uh, progressives and progressive ideas as elitist and ivory tower. Um, and you know, one of the reasons I'll say that, that, that Joe Biden is doing so well is that, is that he is you know, a regular person. I think people can see that he, he is a regular person. I thought it was very funny that Trump mocked him for not going to an Ivy League school. Guess what? Most people, the vast majority of people, uh, half the people don't even go to college. So, you know, I think that it is incumbent on progressives and scientists to learn uh, the effective tools of communications. And I hope people can come visit frontpagelive.com uh, or read my book, How to Go Viral and Reach Millions. And I think you will find uh, what the social science of effective communications has to say about the way it's done. Thank you. Mr. David K. Johnston. Are you still with us? Well, we'll go on sorry. to- Sorry, no, no, I got oh. it. I got it. Sorry, I didn't get the button. Uh, my brother, who's a manual laborer, I asked him once why his neighbors had all these Trump signs. And he said, well, if I believed in God, uh, hated gays or loved guns, I'd be with Donald too. What the hell have the Democrats ever done for me but be Republican light? Uh, I think that we fundamentally need to recognize that we are all a society. So we need universal voting. Donald said if we had mail-in voting, it means universal, uh, no Republican would get elected again. Uh, we need to invest in an education system, not the one we have from the 19th century that was designed to produce drones for factories, but one that develops the critical thinking skills other countries teach. Uh, we need to have, uh, and this very much troubles me, but we clearly need to have, as Dr. Ben Giat pointed out, some kind of change in our regulations for president. We operated on the honor system and it worked to tell Donald Trump it isn't gonna work anymore. We're going to have to find ways to put controls on a president, perhaps vet them better before one becomes president. And we have absolutely got to get money out of, uh, uh, out of politics. And one way to do that is every district, you give a public budget and we get to see how candidates would handle the taxpayers' money. That's all not going to work with this Supreme Court, which equates money with dollars, but we can change that. We have the power to do that. I think we should look upon this as an enormous opportunity to do what our Constitution was intended to do, and that was to show how far can the human spirit go if we make people free. Thank you very much. Dr. Phil Zimbardo, your one minute solution, please. Yeah, uh, the, the thing we need a solution for now is curbing the pandemic, which is still out of control. Uh, in fact, many of us take it for granted now. So we have to solutions, make it non-political, put the, put the uh, scientists at the center of, di center of disease control in charge. Uh, um, help uh, clearly fund the ph uh, pharmaceutical companies developing new vaccine, have in place now a, a way of distributing the vaccine <clears throat> around our country. Uh, so this is really, really critical. Um, uh, every day <clears throat> sets a new record in the surge of the pandemic in many places around our country, in almost every single state. <clears throat> so this, this is a problem, I think, uh, has to be number one on the agenda of a new president and for our, our nation to survive. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our panelists for their great contributions. Uh, we will give you a virtual applause. And um, uh, now we'll move on to the question and answer session with the general audience. 
Uh, but before we do so, we have a short presentation from co-author of attorney Richard Painter, uh, Dr. Claire Finkelstein, who has uh, a few moments to um, uh, give a report on. Would you like to begin? Thank you so much, Bandy, and thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, participate today. Um, Richard and I were the co-chairs with Noah Bookbinder of Crew of a major report on the Department of Justice under the tenure of Bill Barr. <clears throat> and um, Bandy has invited me to say a few words about what we did with that report and what we found. Uh, this was a report uh, that we conducted over the summer with the assistance of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law's summer interns. Uh, we had a group of very talented students who worked with us and we put together a steering committee, a bipartisan steering committee uh, with former uh, deputy and uh, acting attorney generals and members of the intelligence community, lawyers, et cetera, to help work with the students. Um, it was really extraordinary uh, what we found, uh, the level of detail that we were able to go into in a short period of time using mostly open sources, but conducting interviews uh, as well of, of individuals who had been in the Department of Justice uh, previously uh, or those who were impacted by Barr's policies. One of the reasons for our deep, deep concern about the Department of Justice has to do with the fact that when you use law and the prosecutorial powers of the Department of Justice to distort law, there is deep damage uh, to our democracy and to the rule of law over a period of many, many years. Uh, if Trump is defeated uh, very shortly, we will have a problem of domestic transitional justice. We will have to decide what is done to hold this presidency, to hold Donald Trump and all those who enabled him accountable. Uh, it is my view, and it was part of the working uh, motivation of this group, that if you do not focus on accountability, your country does not recover. Some of us would argue that's what happened when we went from the torture program in the Bush administration, moved past that program, looking, as Obama said, forward but not back. But then you have someone like Gina Haspel who becomes the director of the CIA. In my view and the view of the committee, we must not let that happen in this case. Uh, it is critically important at the very least that we establish uh, as much of, we, of the facts as we can about what Bill Barr did to enable Donald Trump's authoritarianism in running the Justice Department. We'll say very briefly, we covered eight different areas of inquiry uh, and the more we looked, the more appalled we were. Uh, we looked at number one, Bill Barr's handling of the Russia investigation and the deception that he engaged in, in rolling out the Mueller report. We looked at his possible involvement in the Ukraine scandal, which is really not uncovered in the impeachment proceedings. We looked at his use of the Justice Department to engage in counter investigations. Uh, I believe that it was his intent originally to use the Durham report uh, to engage in a kind of immediate pre-election um, uh, October surprise. Uh, that has fallen flat for him, and it looks as though Donald Trump may actually be retributive with regard to the failure of the Durham report, but it is a deep miscarriage of justice and a distortion of justice to use investigations against political rivals. Uh, we examined the politicization of prosecutions uh, to give lenient sentences or commutation to friends of Donald Trump who were willing to help him cover up his misdeeds. We looked at the abuse of emergency powers and the deployment of federal agents uh, in, uh, in Portland, and we looked in detail at what happened in Lafayette Square. And it looks as though Bill Barr was directly and personally involved in giving orders to the DC police. We looked at the firing of politically independent federal employees, uh, such as inspectors general. Uh, and it's obvious that there has to be uh, great strengthening of the independence of inspectors general. 
We looked at the politicization of the intelligence community uh, and the deep damage that that has done and will continue to do, I think, for quite a long time. And finally, we looked at the politicization of a number of critical offices in the Department of Justice, such as the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, which has a very uh, deep and problematic history in terms of distorting the law. Uh, it is our firm belief that there needs to be um, correction, adjustment, and accountability for these misdeeds. And we strongly recommended, again, the results of a bipartisan investigation uh, that there should be an impeachment inquiry into the activities of Bill Barr at the Justice Department. And that is still necessary and still critical, even if Joe Biden wins this election and we have new leadership in the Department of Justice. Thank you very much, Dr. Fickelstein. Um, that the Attorney General use the law to subvert the law um, is a parallel that we have also made with the mental health field, that the American Psychiatric Association has subverted professional ethics to subvert our professional responsibility to society. And so all fields in all professional domains uh, probably need to stay with their standards and norms and to hold people accountable when they stray from them. Um, now, before we go to the audience questions, uh, we have a short video. Uh, first of all, um, in March of this year, when we heard about the pandemic, we issued the Prescription for Survival. It can be found on prescriptionforsurvival.org, where we stated that for medical reasons, we believe that the president needed to be removed from office as a removal process of removal from dangers, and uh, if not, that his influence be removed. Uh, and since our prescription has not been heeded, and so this is a sampling of more than 100 psychiatrists and mental health experts who go on video record to state that this president needs to be removed from presidency and candidacy for re-election for reasons of psychological dangerousness and mental unfitness for which we have standards. I'm signing this statement to help protect our democracy. As a descendant of families who came here in colonial days, as an ally of those who are not white and privileged, and as a long time, lifelong protector of children and families. Donald Trump is not only not psychologically fit to be president, but he has proved himself to be a danger to our nation. My name is Jill Barbary, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Illinois, and additionally licensed in special education and preschool through sixth grade education in New York State. My name is Elaine Belson. I am a licensed clinical social worker of 27 years residing in Maryland and a former XO of MedCom OEF. For over three years, mental health professionals have been warning the public of the dangers posed by Donald Trump. Time and time again, our warnings have proven accurate but have gone unheeded. All the chaos and destruction our country and our allies have experienced can be explained by one factor, Donald Trump's severe psychiatric pathology. I sign this statement with urgency to protect the country and the world before Donald Trump does additional damage. My patients keep asking me, why doesn't somebody do something? They feel they've been taken hostage by the president and his enablers. On behalf of them and all Americans, it's time that we all join. I am Dr. Elizabeth Bennett, licensed psychologist from Massachusetts. Arthur Blank, Jr. I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at George Washington University and a psychoanalyst. I teach in the Washington Psychoanalytic Institute and I'm formerly the national director of the VA's community-based counseling centers for combat veterans. Uh, I'm very happy to be signing this statement uh, since we can't have someone as uh, disturbed as the president. Thank you. Now we will go to audience questions. 
when you would let, when you have a question, please go to the bar at the bottom of your screen where it says participants. If you click on it, you will have the option to raise your hand. Uh, and when we call on your name, that's when you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Please keep them brief. Please specify which panelist you would like to direct your question to. And we would ask panelists to keep their answers brief also since we have limited time. The first question will be from Steve Cunningham Bryant. Uh, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Hi, this question is for Dr. Stanley. I was just wondering what you thought a uh, role propaganda could play in countering all the negative propaganda that is being uh, pushed, especially now during the election. Uh, great, great question. Uh, one thing, uh, especially when we face these incredible conspiracy theories like QAnon that remove our ability to communicate with each other. Um, so, uh, so I, I think in the sh in the short term, it's it's going to be mainly action and going out on the streets and social movements where we band together to protect the vote. Uh, in the long term, it's going to be, as I said, changing the social meaning around the words uh, that uh, are the solutions. Uh, we can't shut down solutions. Uh, when the solutions are, don't come from capitalism, uh, we can't shut them down by saying we're capitalists. You know, so we have to change the social meaning and the valence. And I think if you look at young people, they're already doing that. Great. The next question will come from Storm King. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Yes, um, my question is on that same topic, but for Dr. Vandy Lee. A recent reputable poll reported that 20, 20, uh, 50% of people that plan to vote for Trump believe wholeheartedly in this QAnon thing, and that another 30% of them are unsure somehow. Um, one of the tenets of that wacko weird thing is that uh, Trump is this figurehead that is going to lead the storm and arrest all these uh, democratic uh, people that are somehow preying on children for some magic potion thing. What will happen to them if Trump is removed from the equation? Will they continue to seek out some fulfillment of that what I think of as a mass psychosis or, or will it uh, finally uh, peter out? Thank you in advance. Thank you. Uh, I have often spoken about the phenomenon of shared psychosis, where mental symptoms can be transmitted. Uh, we don't often think of them as being contagious, but uh, when you have a setup of uh, strong emotional bonds with an influential figure who has uh, severe mental symptoms and has gone untreated for a very long time, with exposure, uh, uh, those who are attached to the president will come to take on his delusions, paranoia, violence proneness, and, um, and that's something that we often see with individuals with severe mental symptoms who go untreated. Um, the solution usually is to remove that family member or gang leader, uh, hospitalize them, and uh, very rapidly, just as dramatically, those who have adopted those symptoms return to their normal state. Um, so a lot of what we see is symptom contagion, but of course, we also have to deal with the propaganda and the cultic programming that has been happening through the media. And uh, finally, we have to address the problems that the panel has mentioned, the socioeconomic conditions that have given rise to the, to the vulnerability and symptoms in the first place. Uh, relative poverty is far more psychologically injurious than absolute poverty. And that's something we should address long term. Thank you. Great. The next question will be from Mary Teresa Webb. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. My question is for, for Bandy Lee, and it's really two parts. Do you consider the followers of Trump to be cult followers? And uh, if so, if Trump loses, do you anticipate violence? Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, um, the violence proneness and uh, the, the dangers of violence is something that we have often discussed and alerted about that 
um, we have seen how the president uh, incites violence and, and um, has done so on multiple domains. And, and we are now at the brink of uh, some kind of violence, uh, whether it's civil war or international war or even nuclear war, is almost serendipitous as the nature of violence is. Um, but there are many things we can do to prevent violence and, and part of it has to do with working with the individual psychology. Uh, other things have to do with prevention um, at, at a more societal and global scale. And so that is one of the reasons why we have assembled. Um, as for specific psychological techniques, you can go to uh, the new book that I published, uh, Profile of a Nation, Trump's Mind, America's Soul, which is a full psychological analysis of Donald Trump in the context of his followers and the nation. It's sold on Amazon and my website, bandylee.com. Thank you. Great, the next question will be from Robert Covington. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who's participating today and thank you, Dr. Lee, uh, for your leadership. Uh, my question is for you and um, Dr. Ben -Giat. So, and I want to sort of piggyback off of um, Mr. David K. Johnston as it relates to the post-Trump potential leader. And I mean it in terms of what do you see your role and Dr. Ben -Giat's role in the future when it comes to future candidates and your duty to warn when you see what we've already experienced and we already know people like Tom Cotton are already planning uh, a 2024 run and these kind of people that are a little more sophisticated, a little more intelligent, not as lazy as Trump, but have similar characteristics and are just biting. They see what can actually happen. So what do you see your role, if any, in moving forward in terms of educating the public from your lens, your expertise, um, and getting that information out to the larger public and how we look at future candidates that are be running for high office? Thank you. Thank you. Due to limitation of time, I'd like to turn the question over to Dr. Ben Giet, please. Sure. Um, one of the reasons I mentioned that um, in my remarks that there is this human capacity for denial is that in, in doing the research for over a hundred years of authoritarian regimes for this uh, forthcoming book of mine called Strongmen, which goes from Mussolini up to Trump, I, I see these common you know, psychological and emotional patterns, whether it's um, th th these every so often these individuals come up and they manage to coalesce existing uh, anti-democratic and other tendencies. They, they're usually very, very good with media. They know how to make people attach to them emotionally. Um, and, and these are times of great reckoning uh, with cherished national myths, such as, you know, America is a true democracy, or the Chileans in the 1970s said it can't happen here to us. So, so in the, in the future, um, I mean, one of the things we have to reckon with is that, as, as was said before, the, the GOP is truly an authoritarian party. And there have been some very interesting comparative politics studies recently published that show that they looked at the platforms of the GOP next to all kinds of far right parties, even like Golden Dawn and uh, all kinds of, you know, global parties. And it, and it, it is a far right party on many, um, on many issues. And we haven't really fully reckoned with that. And this is why I think my role would continue to be uh, showing how history is, is a warning, but also history is a consolation. In my book, I have a chapter on resistance because uh, people have gotten through this before. And, and if Trump wins again, we're gonna need to remember that, uh, that it leads to a greater appreciation of rights, uh, greater mobilizations, uh, and, and a reminder that we're nothing without community and that we have to um, relearn the values of compassion and solidarity. And this is part of these historical cycles that sometimes you have to, 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 to lose democracy or almost lose it to appreciate what you have. Thank you. Um, 
Leonard, we can go to yeah, the next. Yeah. Uh, great. The next question will come from Karen Polis. If you can unmute your microphone and please yes. go ahead. Thank you so much. This is for Dr. Lee. My question is, and I live in Washington, D.C., if Trump loses, this has to do with how dangerous it will be for the nation if he loses. And really also working in the idea of, I believe we've been in a cold civil war since 2016, as it's warming up with increased violence. If we were to have a civil war, what would it look like and who would be on either side? Um, thank you. Uh, just as um, violence is kind of the end product of a long process, it's hard to predict exactly what uh, form it will take, but we can shape uh, or prevent what form it takes by strengthening ourselves and, and, um, uh, and essentially giving ourselves the, the readiness to um, not accept that and to hold Donald Trump accountable. So some of the things that we could start doing is what was discussed earlier, uh, hold Bill Barr accountable and start an impeachment process. We could start an impeachment process of the president. We could uh, start a 25th Amendment hearings, even if it does not end up with uh, the desired result. The process uh, works a great deal in shaping uh, the outcome. And, and that's the reason why we put out our prescription for survival, which uh, shows many possibilities, many options. Next question, please. Great. Our next question will come from Kevin Washington. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question goes more towards, uh, I think, uh, what Dr. Stanley positioned as a uh, lingua franca, uh, a language, a linguistic aspect of the process of uh, the discourse around Trump, and I talk about the Trumpian rhetoric, that even though there have been this casting of socialism as being problematic uh, term terminology, as well as other elements of the discourse around uh, uh, Donald Trump, I posit that uh, the conversation has clearly been around the notion of white supremacist ideology, which he's been an ex excellent market to, marketeer of that, that construct, but not the creator of such. And that at this time, this conversation becomes one where the dog whistle discourse speaks to this particular languaging uh, and ideology of a population. And so even though we can shift the word and have wordsmithing of of socialism being problematic or neoliberalism or conservatism, uh, it still stems around this issue of the ideology of white supremacy. So the question then becomes, uh, how do we see, or how do you see this idea of languaging, being able to capture the construct of socialism when socialism becomes a threat to the ideology of white supremacy, which is predicated on the notion of having one group to have power over, the, over another? that does, can we challenge that? And does the removal of a president that has marketed this allows us to be in, get into a position by which we can see that the platform becomes equal for all people or do we still get stuck in this idea of wordsmithing where we are masking uh, white supremacists all over again? Uh, could, I, could I address that, Bandy? Sure. Um, so that's absolutely right. And I think it really needs to be emphasized uh, I think one needs to understand the history of the United States. That's why it's so important to see that Trump is a symptom, not a cause. And it gives us hope because black American intellectuals have been pointing this out and fighting it forever. And so other countries don't have that resource. Uh, as you, uh, to understand the connection here between the socialism talk, the leftism talk, uh, uh, and race and white supremacy. Just think, what did they call every single leader from civil for civil rights? Uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King was supposedly a communist. And obviously, Du Bois, uh, Paul Robeson. Well, many of them were communists, but that's because communism stood up against white supremacy in the United States. Um, so if you look back at the second Klan, at the ideology of the Klan in the 1920s, we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, 
so it, this is not accidental. The idea was uh, Marxists, Jewish Marxists were pushing a race war, bringing in immigrants and pushing black Americans into a race war so they could take over. <laughs> so when people are doing this thing about, uh, so you, you know, the, the GOP has been putting out this postcard with Bernie Sanders, Jewish socialist, driving uh, a bus with the squad there, uh, you know, uh, there, there, thereby, you know, that harkens back to an extremely long American far right KKK uh, style uh, conspiracy theory and, uh, uh, view. And it also overlaps, as Nancy McLean has pointed out, uh, with Nazi ideology in the 20s and 30s. So uh, the attack on socialism, the idea that socialists are behind Black Lives Matter, that is a long American story. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, would you like to add to that? He may be no longer with us. Next question, please. Great, our next question will come from Marion. Uh, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Yes, it was for um, Mr. Sachs. And thank you everybody for being here and doing this today. Jeffrey Sachs, um, you gave a wonderful laundry list of some of the emergency actions that are gonna be, need to be taken if we have a new president uh, in January of 2021. Could you uh, go over that a bit more and maybe uh, say what do you think are the most important? I know things would have to be, a lot of things have to be done simultaneously. How would you expand on what you already shared with us? Marion, thank you very much. Uh, just to say uh, this list, which I'll uh, share with Bandy if she can post it somehow so that people uh, can, can look at it uh, afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, is, is actually a list of uh, practical steps that uh, can be undertaken uh, in pretty uh, quick order because a lot of it is reversing uh, deliberate damage by Trump. Uh, so, and other actions are <laughs> so overdue, of course, like the basics of public health interventions, which uh, any sane leader would have put in place months ago and which I would count on Biden putting in place and in the first day, basically, because these are known, proven public health measures that can decisively suppress the pandemic. And so the, the points that I mentioned are uh, things like uh, stopping uh, the pandemic through the public health measures where we've waited for months for this to happen, uh, signing what actually will pass Congress, uh, which is funding for dare I say, blue cities as well as red cities and suburbs and the whole country uh, to make sure that we have the adequate funding to be able to move forward. Reversing many vicious actions by Trump, such as pulling out of the World Health Organization at the peak of the worst global pandemic uh, in a century, that's something that can be done uh, immediately by a president because it was put in place by one person. Uh, and then I would hope that we would take several steps that will require legislation to uh, correct the weaknesses of our voting system so that we are not skirting at the edge of authoritarianism as we've been talking about this whole session so that people can vote. And when we have mass voting, I think it's important to say that the underlying racism and uh, vulgarity that has been driving this does not have majority support. That's why Trump's modus operandi and his cronies modus operandi is voter suppression because they know that if people vote, th this is not a majority position in this country today. Uh, young people are completely against this agenda. Uh, and so, if we get voting solved better than this horrendous uh, rickety system that is designed for voter suppression, that has been part of the racist structure, uh, then we will solidify the democratic, uh, that small d, <laughs> democratic institutions for the future. And I, I do want to say, I think it was uh, David K. Johnson, uh, and, and of course I'm a 
Johnston, and I'm a great fan, but he said that our Constitution was designed for maximum uh, uh, liberty. That's not quite right. Uh, it was designed in the context of a slave nation, and it has many deep flaws which have left us vulnerable throughout our history. And uh, we need to continue in our generation to build uh, a system that is truly designed for freedom for everybody. Uh, and we can do it, but uh, we have seen exposed how unbelievably fragile this is, and we're just at the edge. So the next few weeks are the most decisive challenge for our generation. Vote, defeat this bum, and then get him out of there according to the vote. And then we can implement uh, measures to uh, correct this uh, rickety system that we uh, now understand we have in a way that a vast majority of Americans want to uh, correct. Bandy, if I may. Yes, oh, please Andy, go ahead. Uh, uh, Jeffrey is exactly right. Um, I was taking the optimistic uh, point that uh, even with the embedded racism, ownership of people, and lots of other things that are in our Constitution that I teach my, I'm not a lawyer, but I teach third year law students. Um, it is the idea that we will improve, we will govern ourselves, and we will do better. We have a long way to go. And the reality is the Civil War from the 1860s isn't over. Thank you. For everyone's information, uh, Dr. Sachs's list and information from this conference will be listed on our website on, at dangerouscase.org. Next question, please. Great. The next question will come from the Zoom user with the uh, name Resistor Girl. Um, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, so I'm an immigrant to the US. I'm not a citizen yet. I'm still just a permanent resident. And I have nothing that I can do other than um, phone bank and try to get other people to vote. My fear after phone banking for many months is that we're going to end up in a situation where the election is close. So it's all great to say, yeah, we could impeach Trump, we could impeach Barr. We know that Congress isn't going to do that. What else can we do for anybody who'd like to answer to protect ourselves during this period after the election? If anybody has anything, I'd really like to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to address that question? Uh, the, the answer to that is overwhelming turnout by people who are going to vote this bum out, as uh, Jeffrey said. Um, I, I've predicted and said this morning on British uh, radio that uh, Biden will win by at least 16 million popular votes, hopefully more than 20. But the bigger the margin, the better the chance that we will have an acceptance uh, and a rejection of the absolutely guaranteed voter intimidation on November 3rd and court challenges uh, by not just Donald Trump, but the Republican Party, which is now the party of Donald Trump. Thank you. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet, uh, would you like to address this question? Well, I, I will. Um, I think on election day, turnout's absolutely critical. But we also need to make sure that every single vote is counted. And we have a litigation now uh, where the Republican Party in Pennsylvania has tried to force the state to stop counting on election day, even ballots that are cast mm -hmm. on time. And they want to go back to the Supreme Court. I believe they're hoping that a Justice Barrett will be there waiting to uh, sign on uh, and change the opinion on that next week. Uh, this situation with kind and the ballots needs to be watched very carefully. Uh, and we may have some chaos after the election. So we need to be prepared to have lawyers on the ground in Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, perhaps Wisconsin, any other states. Uh, where things are close and people want to play games with the ballots. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of mischief going on Election Day. They're trying to discourage people from using the Postal Service. Uh, thanks for our Postmaster General. I testified in front of Congress about that a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we uh, need to be ready on Election Day to make sure everyone who hasn't voted by mail gets to the polls and then every single vote is counted. It's going to be critically important. Uh, let me. Thank uh, you very much. Oh, please. 
Yes, let me just add to that. I, I certainly endorse whatever we can do now to get to the polls and organize. Uh, but I think we all need again to think deeply that why this man arose and why so many populists like him and even worse are rising in, throughout the advanced industrial and capitalist world. We have a bigger problem. We first, number one, two, three, and four is to get rid of Donald Trump but we need to build from the bottom up a whole thing. Think of the women's movement, think of the civil rights movement, the 20, 30 year buildup of a whole different direction that will constrain the possibilities that are moving, that are emerging all over the world. This is not simply an American problem, but a deep, deep systemic problem. So it's walk on two legs as the Chinese say, deal with Trump, but also deal with the underlying systemic difficulties we're facing. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, one last question. Great. Um, so that um, so Corey, um, last name is uh, Yilmaz. Um, go ahead, unmute your microphone. Thank you. Um, yes. Thanks. Thanks for allowing me to ask a question. Um, and thank you, Bandy Lee. I'm also a psychiatrist, and I appreciate what you're doing um, to spread the word. I've had so many people ask me, you know, what's wrong with him, basically, and I appreciate your help. Um, I, uh, question for Richard Painter, um, um, there's, it seems to me like there's going to be no enforcement for any of the, um, actions we've seen during this presidency or from the justice department and the next administration might let this go. And I was wondering, um, will New York state, uh, take over, um, uh, enforcing some of the misbehavior we've seen? And um, I've read that a lot of the New York, New York um, uh, Attorney General is investigating this, but um, mostly they're looking at civil charges. Will anybody face criminal charges after um, Trump, uh, the Trump presidency is over? Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I believe so. First on the federal uh, side, I hope that a new president um, would be President Biden would appoint an independent counsel to investigate any and all criminal activity that took place during the prior administration. It should not be a political appointee. It should be an independent counsel uh, who can make those decisions. Uh, and we should not make the mistake, as uh, Professor Frankenstein pointed out, we should not make the mistake that we did after the Bush administration, letting the tortured lawyers go uh, scot-free. Uh, so that's the first thing that needs to happen. The president of the United States has exposure to criminal indictment for obstruction of justice, as outlined in part two of the Mueller report. The New York attorney general could bring charges. We don't know what's going on in that grand jury. Uh, also, the president of the United States very, may, very well may be guilty of, uh, of criminal violations of the Hatch Act. I'm currently working with uh, uh, Professor Finkelstein on a law review article that lays out a lot of this. Uh, of these uh, criminal charges that could be brought. And uh, I think that this is uh, something that's very likely to happen, uh, both the New York level, uh, state level, the AG, and the federal government. And yes, civil charges as well. The Trump Organization has been getting away with way too much for a long time in New York. And we wouldn't be in this mess if the New York Attorney General over the past couple of decades had been focusing on what's going on over there at Trump Tower. Andy, if I can add to what Richard said. Sure. Um, it is virtually certain that Donald Trump is going to be indicted by the Manhattan District Attorney, uh, most likely on bank, uh, business records, accounting, insurance fraud, and tax fraud. And I would say there's a fairly good chance there will be a state racketeering enterprise charge based on Eric Trump's efforts to avoid testifying in a case where his lawyers unless they're utterly incompetent, must have warned him about the prospect of a racketeering charge. And if there is a racketeering charge uh, indictment simply returned, at that point, the state can seize all assets of that enterprise, which of course would be deeply troubling to Donald Trump, but state law provides for that. Um, I greatly dislike the idea and think it would be a grave mistake for the long-term uh, welfare of the Republic for the federal government to prosecute Donald Trump, no matter what he's done. The state of New York can do that just fine, and so can some other states. Um, uh, and there's no reason the federal government can't prosecute, for example, Jared Kushner, if it turns out that he had any role in the murder of the journalist 
uh, Jamal Khashoggi if uh, he had any role to play in other activities by the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia MBS, that led to deaths and other things there. Uh, the same applies to everybody else. And I hope that Joe Biden, uh, once it is settled that he's going to be the next president, uh, makes the following announcement. If you committed crimes, including the destruction of federal records, which can be a felony, and come forward now and completely disgorge and agree to testify against other people, our promise is that uh, we will try not to prosecute you. If we think we have to prosecute you, we will ask a judge not to send you to prison. Anybody who doesn't, you will feel the full weight of the United States Justice Department upon you, and we will hire additional prosecutors as needed to make sure that justice is done. Thank you. Uh, now we're almost out of time. Dr. Rom, do you have a last word to give? You have 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. No? I'm uh, here. Oh, I just okay. thank you so much. I, I've been listening to all this great commentary. I, I just uh, want people to stay uh, optimistic uh, that, you know, uh, in some sense, we're fortunate, I think, that Donald Trump is as extreme a, you know, a uh, 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 mental condition as he is, um, that we didn't have some much more sophisticated uh, um, and smarter uh, authoritarian. Uh, and if we can indeed sweep him out of office, uh, then hopefully we will be able to put in place protections. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, I, I, I do think that overall, the reaction to Trump has been uh, a cause for hope and optimism. And uh, it's just, it will be so important for everyone who was engaged in this election to be engaged in two years in that election. So we don't get the backlash again, where our voters get discouraged and, and the other side doesn't so I you know I, I think it, it, people need to be able to take the long view here um, and if I think you take the long view then uh, there is cause for optimism. Okay, uh, I guess that concludes our um, conference today. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, please join me in giving a virtual applause to all our speakers, panelists who have come together. Um, uh, in, in, uh, on very short no notice for this emergency conference. And thank you once again. Good night. <laughs>